Yeah. Sid Canoe is back. How are wow. you doing, John? <laughs> you are amazingly entertaining. You really are, as a matter of fact. The Gazelars are a um, Turkic confederacy. Uh, they dominated uh, the region between the Dnieper and the Volga for several centuries up until actually the rise of Kiev and Rus, uh, which ended up crushing their confederacy. Uh, they battled the Arabs multiple times. Uh, they uh, allied with Byzantium uh, in the seventh, uh, well, actually, uh, let's say eighth, eighth to ninth centuries. And in fact, married um, several times into the Byzantine royal lineage uh, uh, in several different dynasties. And um, they were Turkic. Uh, they were physically quite distinct. Um, they were described by the Byzantines as you would describe Turks, you know, kind of like uh, flat featured, um, you know, swarthy skinned, dark haired. So they look Turkish, we know that, and we have some DNA from modern Turks and some ancient Turks. Um, what's associated with the Turks is often haplogroup Q, uh, which is um, common among many uh, Altaic Siberian peoples. Uh, but another thing associated with the Turks is R1A. That's often R1A Z93, uh, but there are other types of R1As. And these are from probably, almost certainly from Indo-Europeans. And so why would an Indo-European be present in the, in the early Turkic lineage? It's because Indo-Europeans were present in the Altai region as early as 3,000 or 5,000 years ago in the Afanasivo people. So Indo-Europeans and Turks kind of emerged together. Uh, eventually the Turks rose and pushed out the Indo-Europeans, the Scythians, the Sarmatians, uh, the Ossetians, the Alans, all these groups, the Iranian speaking peoples of Central Asia, like the Khrezmians, the Vesoktians. But um, they didn't just exterminate them, they absorbed them. And so uh, the Khazars themselves were Turkic speaking. Uh, they had a Turkic identity, but they had within them uh, ancestry from Sarmatians, Scythians, Sogdians, all these other groups. I'm only bringing this up, well, I mean, not only, but I'm bringing this up because there is a connection between the Jews, supposedly Ashkenazi Jews and the Khazars. This is not really mostly supported genetically because there's very little evidence of, say, East Asian asthma and mixture in Ashkenazi Jews. But there's a little, there's a little. So this is what I will say. I believe that eventually genetics will validate the possibility that some few lineages of the Ashkenazim go back towards indigenous people absorbed in Eastern Europe, in what is today modern Russia, who probably descend from some Khazar Jews. Okay, I, I do think that that's probably true. It's a very small number, but it's not nobody. Okay, I, I think there are gonna be a small number. The Khazars themselves were religiously diverse. Some of them remained shamanists, worshippers of Tengri. Uh, others were Muslim and others were Orthodox Christian. And then of course, some were Jewish. Um, what I've read is that there is a supposition that the royal house of the Khazars adopted Judaism, partly to distinguish themselves from their neighbors, uh, the Christians to the West, the Muslims to the South. And so it was a good, good way to kind of, you know, compromise and, and stay neutral. And we, still, we see this um, later in history with pagan Lithuania, where they were apparently pagan for a really long time because they didn't want to pick Orthodoxy or Catholicism. They wanted to kind of hold out uh, so they had negotiating positions. So the Khazars were doing this with Judaism, I think. And so they were one of the great Turkish confederacy, Turkic confederacies, right? And Kiev and Rus crushed them in a series of battles, and eventually they disappear from history. But um, the Khazars are just one chapter in a longer story. Uh, earlier stories, the Go Turks, uh, the first Turkish empire, which comes like all the way from basically Romania to Mongolia. It prefigures the Mongol Empire, and then later the Mongols themselves were highly Turkified in the Golden Horde. Uh, so the Russians were under the yoke of the Tatars, the Tatar yoke. So the, the victory of Kiev and Rus was a um, temporary affair in a way, when you think of it historically when it came to the steppe versus the settled, the farmers uh, versus the nomad. So the Khazars ultimately lost, lost their battle against the various peoples um, who they fought. Because they fought the Arabs, they won, um, they allied with the Byzantines, and uh, they were dominant for two to three centuries, but then the Russians uh, under the Rurikids uh, crushed them, okay? So these are, uh, you know, led by Varangians, Scandinavians, uh, who assimilated into the Slavic population, but eventually they themselves were overwhelmed by the Mongols, who were led by many Kipchak Turks. So. Um, the Khazars are just part of, I think, a bigger story here. But an interesting part with the Judaism. Before ending this episode, I'd like to ask two follow-up questions. And that is, we've discussed what modern DNA studies has told us about the Khazars. And so now I'd like to ask, what were some of the traditional viewpoints as to who they were 
especially in older historiography. You know, I think the older historiography kind of knew they were Turks, but really what they said was they were heathens. So the, Judy, the Judaism of the Khazar is actually kind of late, I think, as they became more and more intertwined with, uh, you know, the quote, civilized world. Uh, so the key with the Khazars is they, like the Huns and the Avars, they're an Eastern Asiatic people that are not Christian, that come onto the edge of the civilized world on the backs of horses in, in you know, huts. They are, they are Gog and Magog. Uh, they are the sons of Japheth come from the East, you know? So Christians tend to interpret them in a very, very biblical way. Arabs, Muslims actually had similar explanations for Turks to the point where there's a Turkic scholar in Baghdad in the ninth century who wrote a counter narrative of how the Turks were actually going to be the salvation of the human race and not like, you know, not like the heralds of the Antichrist, which is what the Arab Muslims were saying. And so in terms of the older historiography, um, they were viewed as alien, as like uncivilized, as almost subhuman, right? So um, this is this is the story of the steppe nomad and what, what they've had to deal with in terms of their depiction by settled peoples. From blog post comments to threads on YouTube, anything dealing with the Khazars, you tend to notice a focus on Judaism. And so my main question is, we know that Judaism did play a role, albeit according to what we've discussed so far, maybe not as big as a role as we would imagine. And so my question is, when it comes to Judaism, the Khazars, and today, could there be a form of ethnic nationalism at play when it comes to focusing on just the Judeo aspect of the Khazars? I mean, yeah. I mean, insofar as, you know, there's a whole group of anti-Semites who want to disconnect modern Jews from uh, ancient Hebrews by saying they're Khazar converts. That's obviously false. Uh, modern Jews are about like 40 to 50 percent Middle Eastern and Ans Ashkenazi Jews. 40 to 50 percent Middle Eastern ancestry, about like you know 30 to 40 percent Southwest European, and then the rest is Northern European, like 10 to 20 percent, you know, somewhere in that range. Um, so they're not they're not Khazars. Like I said, they have like a little bit. Um, there's some evidence of some East Asian ancestry in some groups. And where does that come from? We don't necessarily know. I think it could be Khazars. As far as the Khazars themselves, there's a lot more about them than their Judaism. But you know, we want to interpret in a modern lens in a way that's relevant to us. And you know, as as your as your viewers know, um, the step is kind of ignored. It's just not a compelling narrative for most people. It's a source of bar barbarism, scourge of God, uh, terror and destruction. I mean, that's not totally unfair, but it's not all it is. So this idea of a Jewish Turkic tribe in um, you know tents on the Volga that's just much more exotic and relatable. I think. Even though I've taught at the university for many years. We all know that the things that are really important, we don't learn at the university. The things that are important, we learn. And one of the things that many people learned is that the Khazars, a very powerful and significant nation in Central Asia, in the Middle Ages, had nothing better to do but to become Jews. I mean, they were dying to keep kosher and to observe the Sabbath. But that's what we're told they did. If we ask somebody where they know it, they would find it difficult to say. These are one of the things that we learned. Several years ago, actually it's more than several, maybe a little more than a decade ago, a professor at Tel Aviv University wrote an article and he said, I don't believe it. It never happened. I read the article. I was very surprised. And I waited for the great scholars to say something about this article. But they didn't. All quiet. So I decided to look at the facts. And I thought I would write a brilliant article to show where this person was wrong. And what happened was, he was right. I started looking into the stories about the Khazars. How do most Jews, I think, know about the Khazar conversion? Because there was a famous book of Jewish philosophy called the Khuzari, describing how the king of the Khazars discussed the religion with the rabbi 
and he was convinced to convert. Most people haven't read the book, but they heard of the book. However, this book was written hundreds of years after the time that the Khazars were active, and you can't really rely on that book as a source. Those few people who were looking for information turned to an earlier source, and that is a correspondence between the king of the Khazars and a famous Jewish scholar and court official in Spain. Now, this is a beautiful text written in beautiful Hebrew. But most of the scholars who looked at this text had never taught high school. And if you teach high school and you get a beautiful paper with many words in Latin and Greek and French, you know one thing. The student did not write this paper. How is some Khazar chieftain spent most of his time fighting going to write a letter in beautiful Hebrew to a court, court official in faraway Spain? You have to be very, very cautious. You can say that perhaps he had a secretary who wrote the letter for him, but if you're off in the middle of the Khazar lands, which is now near the, uh, in the Caspian Sea, where are you going to find a secretary whose Hebrew is that beautiful? I don't think there are a hundred people in Israel who could write today a letter that beautiful. There were people in Spain who did. And the minute you see something which is too good to be true, you have to wonder, is it true? If you look at the letter carefully, you see there are many, many problems with the letter. The, the person who wrote it, king or secretary or Spanish forger, knew a great deal about the part of the Khazar lands that were close to the, Medi to the Black Sea and to the Mediterranean. He knew very little about the other parts of the Khazar lands. The story itself claims that the Khazars converted to Judaism before there was a Khazar kingdom. If you check the dates, it happened so many years ago, it was before there was even a ruling group. So there are some real problems there. The biggest problem, though, is what does not exist. Great scholars like Maimonides make no mention of the Khazars, even though they would be very happy to have used the story as proof that Judaism is better than any other religion. The Byzantines, who had an alliance with Khazars and were cared about religion because they were Orthodox Christians, they had correspondence, they had sources, they had discussions. Not a word of the fact that the people they were dealing with were the people who may have crucified Jesus. Not a word, no explanation, no justification. The Georgian shore sources have nothing. Perhaps most critical is that the Babylonian Jewish community, which was very concerned about raising funds to support the institutions in Babylonia and had good contacts everywhere, never mention raising money or sending a delegation to bring money from this kingdom, which was not that far away from Babylonia. And if they would have had a kingdom that was Jewish, kept the Sabbath and kept the kosher laws, that would have been the first target to uh, attempt to reach to raise funds. We all know the joke, how do we know there are no Jews on the moon? because the Jewish fundraisers have never gone to the moon to bring money. And if there were Jews there, they would have been there. So what evidence do we have? The evidence, the main evidence that we have, aside from very problematic Hebrew sources, are Muslim historians who generally hated the Khazars for very good reasons, because the Khazars blocked the Muslim advance 
into Russia. And this was not, wasn't quite appreciated by the Varangians, but the Khazars did the dirty work that preserved Russian independence. But the Muslims had a lot of counts to settle with the Khazars, and being Jewish was certainly no compliment. However, when we look at the Muslim historians, almost each one has a different story. When did it happen? Why did it happen? Who converted? How many converted? There are too many stories. They're all good. They're all very good stories, but there are too many stories. This is exactly what happens when you know one fact, they converted, and somebody says how, and each person who repeated the fact comes up with a story. But it's very difficult to have the stories match. That's why investigators always investigate witnesses separately to see if the stories match or not. Here, the stories do not match. So the big question is, why do so many people believe that the Khazars converted? The evidence is so problematic. The best sources say nothing about the Khazar conversion. So why is it believed? It's because the things that people are told are very often accepted. And if you see the same story three times, you don't check, are those three times good sources? You say, everybody says it. And if everybody says it, it has to be true. One of the main services of the Nevsland Center, with which I was associated in very ways, is that the goal is to be critical. Not to believe things just because somebody says it, but to examine the facts, to examine the reality, and then to come to conclusions on the, on the basis of sources and analytical thought. Here there is no, no, no room for fake news. What we are interested in, or what, till the degree I was involved, we were interested in was what was real, what actually happened. If you are interested in knowing more about the Khazars, and I just touched the tip of a long topic, please contact the Nevzlin Center. I have an article in English, I have an article in Russian, if you contact them, they will be happy to contact me and I'll be happy to send it to you. Call me back or better yet, go on hold and grab Sid's uh, details so I can reach out to him, his email or phone number somewhere. Okay, that'll work.